Right here we go. Kangaroo Jack. What? Rue. Atheism. Rue. Atheist Rue. Devin Tracy. Is Hello. Best. Bye. Right here on the Bubble Defense Show. This is his website. Atheism is unstoppable.com. We're going to hit you up with this. This is his page on censored.tv. That's where you can get him. Oh, damn. Still Aiden Miller can't play here. You. Fucking producer. Can't do shit. And this is his Twitter page at he wasn't jogging. Catch him there. Devin Tracy, thanks for your time, brother. I appreciate it. I'm a huge fan. That's incredible. This sounds very professional. And uh, <laughs> you've done this before. I mean, I, just like, yeah, a couple of times. I used to have a radio show back in the day, but uh, I got in trouble for, you know, telling people not to send money to the Cancer Society and then making fun of a local uh, festival called the Grape and Wine Festival. So they thought that was. Hmm. That was That's all it takes. Yeah, I guess so. Brother, uh, I'm a huge fan. Uh, haven't. I was only introduced to you since you stepped onto the censor.tv platform. Love Gavin's stuff. Love the way those guys interact. And now I'm a huge fan of Jim Goad too. I didn't know who Jim Goad was until censor.tv. So I don't know. I've never was a compound media guy and uh, I'm not familiar with your history. So um, maybe tell us a little bit about how you got started on YouTube and some of the troubles you ran in as far as censorship and what pushed you to come on down to censor.tv for a platform. Yeah, it's an interesting uh, concept. I never really planned on being a YouTuber. Did it for fun initially. Uh, made a video while I was in South Korea traveling. Uh, just, you know, making fun of Kirk Cameron, doing atheist stuff. And I just kind of wanted to create something and get it seen. But there was no expectations whatsoever. I don't, I don't think I ever thought about censorship. I don't think I anticipated that they would censor my stuff. But then it became very clear, especially once I saw the CEO. You know, once I saw her being interviewed and she's like the queen of cat ladies, I thought, oh my God, this is going to end badly. Her on Rogan? Um, I, I think actually she was doing some softball thing with the Young Turks where, <laughs> you know, and that kind of nauseated me that the notion that the Young Turks have never had a strike and I've had, you know, hundreds. And, you know, you just, you basically figure out the coding of these people and what they're against. And you realize that YouTube was never intended for this. It was intended to be cat videos and you know just funny home videos yeah there's definitely been a genre of political talk independent political talk that seems to be just getting censored all the way around as far as a conservative voice goes now i i'm i mean i'm a 10-time candidate here in canada so mm -hmm. um but over the last five years like actually five years ago today i was involved in my last green party which is as far left as you can get in this country uh, so I've been red pilled over the last few years. It's been painful. Um, and then <laughs> my YouTube channel got, you know, no community guideline strikes ever just disappeared on March 17th. And, uh, dude, it just started to pay me some money, like thousands of dollars. Not every, like, uh, I don't know. I was up to 6 million views or no, mm -hmm. 3 million views and 6,000 subs, which is huge for me. Uh, because I was eight years, not really trying to push it. Just, it was a, like a, a place to, kind of save my videos and my family and stuff like that. So tell us a little bit about your channel. How much, how much dough, how much, how big of a following did you have on YouTube before they terminated you? Well, it was a slow death. I mean, they, they had deleted my channel twice before and I had appealed over several months and gotten it restored uh, always for bogus reasons. And this third time was the sort of post George Floyd, um, whatever you want to call that. And so 
they're just more severe and they think that they're helping the world by censoring people like me. And it's all garbage. Uh, they don't even provide a reason. I mean, it's, it's kind of cynical now. Uh, you'd think that, okay, if you have your terms and you're actually going to show me where I violated them, then I might be able to stomach you censoring me based off, you know, your pre-stated rules, but that doesn't happen. And so you just are left. I felt like I was in an abusive relationship, to be honest. And it sucks because they're the best YouTube, mm -hmm. you know, they have the best technology, the best algorithm, the best um, in terms of numbers. And if you cannot be sustainable financially, then the party's over and you're going home. So I'm lucky that I was able to build an audience on YouTube and now I'm not censored and I'm going, you know, stronger than ever, but it's just the numbers aren't there. So what type of following did you get up to? Were you making that oh. from YouTube? Not, I mean, yeah, not really. I mean, the business model was begging for money. You're, you know, I had about 115,000 subs, a lot of views though, and a lot of support. So the people that watched me were kind of hardcore into me and still are. And I appreciate that. Um, there are many channels that had more subs than me and way less Patreon. Uh, and so I had good engagement, but no ad revenue, nothing like that. And the whole system is meant to screw you. So I was demonetized. Um, oh. I had a Teespring account. They never, I, and I'm just complaining. This, this is like the old days, complaining about YouTube. I mean, <laughs> good riddance to YouTube. I mean, seriously, they are a middleman and they're not necessary. And, I, you know, they're going to deplatform and do what they're going to do. But to be honest, it, it gives me a, a niche in the market, which is mm -hmm. say the things that they're afraid to hear. And people mm -hmm. are going to want to hear that. How'd you get hooked up with Gavin McInnes? I know he kind of looks for guys like you. Well, you probably had a much bigger following than he's used to capturing as far as guys that are banned and, and looking mm. for, for a platform. How did you end up on censor.tv? Well, I was just a fan of Gavin's. I, I think he's a funny guy. I've been watching him. And I noticed people had sent me clips like Gavin had been watching my stuff. He'd been commenting, uh, oh. going over some of my videos. And so I, you know, took note of that. And when I got banned, I thought, well, Gavin's on some pay wall site and he seems to be media savvy and doing his thing. So I reached out to him and he was more than happy. It's a I mean, complete win-win situation for both of us. And you really don't have that many places to go after YouTube. You have all these upstart wannabe companies, but it's way easier said than done in terms of bandwidth and um, yeah. viewership. And it's just not viable. And so with Gavin, there's a nice little market there and it's growing and I'm happy to be on board. Yeah. The bit shoot uh, platform sucks. I heard you, you know, comment mm. at the other day. It's just clunky as all hell. I don't know when processing ends, but I've tried, you know, when I got banned, I should have started another channel immediately, but I'm like, Oh no, I'm under appeal. And I don't want to, you know, I don't want to jeopardize mm. the appeal. So I waited for months and now I've got four channels two which are on two strikes already that, you know, one was a 40 second clip of uh, Brian and Gavin joking around about, you know, my 90 day fiance thing and comparing me to copper cap. It was 39 seconds. They didn't even swear in it uh -huh. and it got a guideline strike. So, you know, a friend of mine, well, hashtag Claudia asked me to put up a clip the other day because she likes sending, you know, the funny clips over to her friends or whatever, because they can't watch it under the, uh, behind the paywall. And I'm like, you know what? I don't know that I can, especially on those channels, because that'll be the third strike. And right now, until I get, I get I'm working on True.Tube as a, pro, a, bo, a broadcast platform just for me for now. Um, mm -hmm. But bandwidth is a huge deal. And uh, so right now I'm using it as a library, YouTube. But I was surprised the amount of cash that it was paying out to me, you know, just being a new uh, brand, like uh, with 6,000 subs. And um, totaling 3 million views, like it was paying me, you know, over a thousand bucks a month just for that. Mm. But uh, yeah. Yeah, I get that, uh, you know, it's it, the platform is, you know, buy my merch, sign up here pretty much now, I guess. Yeah, it's, you know, they, you don't have access to your subs or their emails, which is mm. would be invaluable in terms of marketing. So even though you technically kind of earned them as a fan, Right. You can't really communicate. It's all on YouTube's terms mm -hmm. and it's just might makes right. And they have an agenda. I mean, they're, they're seriously got, it's gotten worse and worse over the years. 
and now I feel like they're so brazen about it. They don't even care. Like mm-hmm. how much bad PR can they take? It, it's not, it doesn't affect them. Yeah. Well, and, they're too big to fail, I guess, is the point, you know, they, they can do whatever they want. They hold the monopoly. Right. And where's the competition? I mean, I'm waiting for Elon Musk or somebody yeah. like that to come out with some kick-ass site. I mean, how hard could it possibly be to do? Mm-hmm. We're talking about streaming video. That's about it. Like Twitch is another Twitch has the same level of quality. It's just their terms of service are probably even worse than YouTube's. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. They don't want any part of anything. Really? Controversial. Hmm. Yeah. And so be it. You know, you got to evolve. You got to roll with the punches and just find a way. That's, that's how humans got to where we are today. Yeah, I really loved the episode where you had your father in there. Tell me a little bit about him and uh, growing up and, you know, where you came from as far as, you know, did you grow up with religion? You know, are you one of those atheists that mock all Christians in public or what? Um, no, I mean, atheism is really never on my mind um, yeah. nowadays. It, there was a moment in time where basically uh, bottled up thoughts and feelings about religion uh, that most people spent you know, most of their lives, the 80s and 90s, and even most of the 2000s. And you can never really express it, because you felt like you're isolated. And, you know, the new atheist movement was kind of like a grand coming out party, essentially for atheists. And we went there and we had a big gay atheist orgy, not literally, but it was, oh, my God, I'm not alone. And um, that felt good. And it was nice. But then at a certain point, it's not my objective to argue religious people out of their religion that's an impossible task and it's an odd goal to have. I know how I feel about it. I'm not worried that I'm not right about it. So why would I spend my time beating on that horse? Mm-hmm. The answer is I won't, I won't spend my time doing that. So, but as far as my father, religiously, he was, you know, just church of England, basic, not really interested in it. Uh, he's a musical theater guy. He's a musician, a s- singer, a songwriter. And, that's where he focuses his attention. Uh, It was never crammed down my throat, although I did go to a Jewish preschool and then a Catholic, I guess, or just Christian elementary school. And, uh, you know, just growing up in society, you're basically fed to be, you know, you're supposed to be a Christian, sort of. You know, I'd fill in Christian if asked what my religion was, but I never really thought about it. And then for me, the doubt crept in early when my mother died when I was five and, a stepsister died when I was eight. And, you know, I, I was fully expecting these people to contact me from the grave as a small child. And that never happened. And I thought, hmm, <laughs> this silence is a bit ominous. And I thought, hmm. yeah, it's probably not much to all this fantasy stuff. But Cool. So where did you grow up, brother? I was born in New York, uh, raised in Los Angeles on the west side by the beach near Malibu. Uh, really, I mean, just an idyllic childhood. Uh, I realize that more and more as I travel more and more and I, re- and I just encounter other people and realize. You mean like privileged, like fortunate? I mean, yeah, it's an incredibly nice neighborhood. Mm-hmm. Uh, just, you know, the block I lived on in terms of safety, friends, you know, that, that innocence is so, I'm, honestly, it might be the last generation to have that innocence. Mm-hmm. You know, my my idea of porn was, fishing out a half a torn picture of a playboy magazine from the sewer you know and it was i feel like i had a slow a slow childhood like i i had an adolescence um i i feel like my maturation was the way it should have been nowadays i think it's a total crapshoot and i kind of pity i don't think anyone could even control it though like i have a, a nephew and a niece and she's on TikTok, and he's, I mean, who the hell Spider knows what? Instagram yesterday. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, I don't know if it was yesterday. I saw the white dog mm-hmm. and you bitching and then panning over to uh, your niece there. What's her name again? Oh, yeah, Skylar. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> hey, Sky, you're going to clean the dog? That was a great, great video. Oh, man. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, it's a challenge. I, and I don't envy parents today, but... I'm not saying it's things were better back in the day. I'm all for progress and stuff. And I don't want to say back in my day, but the challenges are distinctly new now. And I'm not sure if we actually know how to navigate it. 
What do you see as uh, some of the, the biggest, I, I know what topics you seem to find you're passionate about right now, but what do you mm -hmm. think uh, are the top issues today that we need to actually, you know, flesh out and have a decent conversation about? Uh, I would say the umbrella topic is how do we ascertain the truth? Um, mm. This is, you know, the, you take this all the way back to philosophy or what is truth, but I'm talking on just a practical level. Who do we trust on anything? Because I feel the news as an institution has failed us. I don't even think they're pretending to be objective or to have any integrity at this stage. Mm. It's no. a for-profit business. I, I find it hugely problematic, just the whole way it's set up. I don't have a working solution, but I do know when something's broken, it, you have to call it what it is. Mm -hmm. And yeah, it, that's kind of scary. We don't know how to figure out what's true. I mean, that started, the religious debate is basically that, what is true, what is real. Um, I thought there was a secondary, a slightly more subtle point when discussing religion with people. And that was, do you care what is real? And that's not an obvious answer. Because I would walk in assuming everyone wants to live in reality. But if you actually peel back a couple layers, they might even be candid with you and say, you know what, I don't even care. Give me the pill. Give me whatever I can take to make me feel good about my moment-to-moment -moment reality. And what's the difference? Why would I, if reality sucks and is painful and harsh, why would I want to be there? Because our fundamental drive is to gain pleasure and avoid pain. And if you believing in a fantasy or in a certain truth about whatever gives you pleasure and helps you avoid pain, who cares if it's a lie? You know, that, that's a, a question I don't think people maybe ask consciously of themselves, but they answer it in their actions and in their belief systems. Yeah. Do you put yourself in the class of people like I seem to have been putting myself in lately as one of these people that goes around maybe unconsciously or has a underlying commitment to outrage? Like, I, you know, I spend a lot of time on social media. I wanted mm -hmm. to say that I use it for branding and exposure and marketing and stuff like that. But half the time I find myself just scrolling to, to become completely enraged by something stupid. Yeah. It, it is very tricky to avoid outrage. It is marketable. It, it does get clicks. Uh, it is more sensational. It's conflict, you know, and think of a movie or a story where you don't have any conflict. That's a snooze fest. So that's why these things rise to the surface. And that's why a clip goes viral is, will it, will it compel you to feel something extreme? And I don't like getting caught up in that. I definitely like, don't like letting it bleed into my private life or my personal life. So if I do express outrage, it's more of a cleansing or a venting from me. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not adverse to confronting things that are outrageous. So like right now, there's insane, insane stuff going on all over the world. You know, in South Africa, they're marching in the streets and they're white people there being targeted. It's insane. Um, you know, you could pick, pick a region and you could find a reason to be legitimately in a state of alarm about it. But how, I mean, first of all, it's not your job to solve all of the world's problems. Mm -hmm. Second of all, you have to be mindful of your well-being psychologically. So you have to either compartmentalize this or realize there have been problems your whole life. When you were a baby and sucking on a bottle, there were problems all around the world. You just were ignorant of them and blissful. So you have to be able to shut off the nozzle of outrage that is coming to you on social media. And I'm saying grab the steering wheel and manually grind yourself away mm. from that temptation. Yeah. How do you find, how do you, how do you separate the two? Like, you know, you got to have thick skin out here on social media. And especially if you're doing, well, I guess I don't want to say we, I, I'm kind of doing what you're doing. You know, I take a video, I look at it mm -hmm. and I broadcast it, you know, um, a couple different platforms over the years, but you know, people say, yeah, well, you got to have thick skin. You, you just can't when you, you know, and I, I had some fake news come out about me recently because, well, there's nothing going on in my little town in Niagara. And so mm. when you use strong language against a female politician, then you hate women. So that mm. raged on for three or four weeks and I got nothing but you're a piece of human garbage. And I'm like, you know what? It made me realize I'm like, okay, wait, 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 wait. So I said something 
you didn't like it. So that means that I'm an irredeemable human being, but then you come back and you do the same thing to me that I just did. How do you separate <laughs> the love from the hate? You can't, because, you know, I can hear in your voice that, you know, I appreciate that when somebody says, you know, I listen to your stuff and, you know, thank you for whatever that makes a difference for you, right? You feel it, it makes you feel good. How, how do you feel good about the positive stuff? And then I, I don't think you can have one without the other. If you're going to say, well, I don't care what they say on the negative end, then yeah, it shouldn't probably make you feel good if they're giving you a pub too. Well, yeah, there's an unwritten contract that public uh, personas sign when you create content. And that is you're opening yourself up for accolades and praise, but also insults and vicious attacks and smears of your character. And if you're putting your name out there, like you are, like I am, that's a keyword that is going to stay, you know, this is the permanent record. They used to talk about the permanent record when I was growing up in school, you know, this score, this test results going on your permanent record. Yeah. This, the internet actually is the permanent record. And you can't scrub it. And, you know, there's something to be said for it because I'm very wary of un anonymity and that whole culture and the, the weakness that, you know, these guys will say opinions and hide and they're not going to sign their name to it uh, or they'll attack someone and they won't sign their name to it. This is beyond cowardly. But the second you come out there, then, it, you know, we're playing for keeps here. So I, I feel bad that you've been slurred and maligned and I'm sure those people... Like if you insulted a female politician, um, I'm guessing you've probably also insulted some male politicians, but uh, they, they didn't come after you for that. It was enough. certainly not because she was female, but <laughs> yeah. Well, they, this is, and this is the far left feminist. And I know you consider yourself a lefty. I consider myself a lefty too. I'm more socially conscious, but then don't screw with my freedom of speech. Don't tell me that more gun laws are going to make a safer community. Don't tell me boys can become girls and vice versa. Like, can we let them reach puberty naturally before we help them transition? Like, like the left mm. has gone so far left, even though I'm, mm -hmm. I'm socially left, you know, and I've heard you describe yourself that way. They've just yeah. gone so far left. And, you know, this idea, you know, I remember standing up for freedom of speech with the, the, um, the pro-lifers on the corner of their of the street with their abortion, their pictures of abortions, right? Mm -hmm. And one lefty politician in my city here, Greg Miller, you know, I got into a Twitter thing back and forth. And I'm like, dude, that's assault. When you go up and you kick someone's sign and you rip the sign out of their hand, that's assault. And I stand with free speech, not assault. And he says, oh, well, you hate women. <laughs> uh, that guy actually where that happened you, yeah yeah that actually happened. You're, you're talking about uh that event that happened not long ago it was in toronto in high park and that was i stayed at an airbnb right on that corner it was this okay. seriously it was like you cross the street and that's where that kick happened uh which was such an odd thing like oh my god but yeah that guy was a douchebag and right so here's my thing so you you refer to me as a lefty and yes i'm i'm first of all i'm not like some politically active guy i'm not out there campaigning or whatnot right. i watch the soap opera and i'm aware of it but um if you go issue by issue yeah i side with the left but not this new version of the left you know this is i reject and protest to all of it and so it's absurd that we're splitting us up into two groups right. and especially you know you're in canada i'm in germany right now like when, when you broaden this out to international it it doesn't make sense but what people do understand what humans understand is us versus them and they love that the simplicity of it red blue left right mm -hmm. which team are you on what gang are you in like it gets a little bit muddy and a little bit complex if you were to actually burrow down and realize that you know you have nothing to do with a lot of these people i have huge problems with biden and kamala harris huge i didn't vote for them I don't want nothing to do with those people. But, you know, obviously I'd have huge problems with Trump um, and Pence, for God's sake. I mean, so I am what you would call disillusioned, disenfranchised, disinterested. Yeah. And I mean, what am I going to do? Here's the thing. I think there are other groups we can form, form better tribes. So, for example, forget left and right. How about this? Riot, rioting. Are you in favor of rioters or against them? Simple. The police. Do you think the police are a necessary uh, force in our world that provides security and established law and order? Do you find them to be the guardians of civilization? I do. I respect them. Mm -hmm. You tell me that's a political position? It's mm -hmm. absurd. 
so <laughs> those are the new groups we got to form sane groups yeah. awesome man what uh how are you finding uh, oh, i really appreciate your language man and that's you mm-hmm. know like gavin speaks like we used to speak on the playground no one got hurt no one got mm-hmm. offended even with the racial slurs hurled at each other all the time mm-hmm. just everyone was fair game you know no I'm sure there was a little bit of, everyone gets bullying at some point, but so I appreciate your, your, your courage. Cause I think huh. I can't even believe I'm saying this to speak like we used to speak when nobody was offended ever. Now time, <laughs> you know, and uh, I hear you, you know, being mm. choosy about the bleep or whatever. Uh, mm-hmm. I, I get that. But uh, how are you handling your, your, your own self censorship? I, it is interesting because I'm virtually the same. Like the other day I made a video title and I used the word blowjob in it, which mm-hmm. and I thought to myself, I would never have used that in YouTube because there's such pussies with all that stuff. Mm-hmm. And so, but I mean, look, I'm not trying, I don't enjoy dropping racial slurs. It serves no purpose. But the one thing I will do is speak openly and frankly about race because I choose words to indicate to the people listening that I am not afraid to talk about race. And I'm not going to be shamed. I'm not going to be guilted into submission. I'm not going to avoid the topic. I'm not going to shy away from being blunt. And so, no, I'm not dropping N-bombs. I I see no point to it. But that's a distraction. That's a red herring. There are messages that need to be heard. So I think it it serves everyone better to avoid random insulting language and talk about reality. Because the reality of a lot of these situations, it's insulting enough. The truth is pretty severe and, you know, there's a massive gap between what is being spoken about that issue or the narrative being portrayed by mainstream versus what is actually happening on the ground. It is, you know, there's miles between these two things. And so I come from a background, you talk about my father, you know, my father was born in South Africa. Uh, His father is a famous musicologist from South Africa. Um, You know, I, I come from a great man. My father's a great man. And if you were to ask my father, what do you, do you think you're a great man? He'd say, I'm okay, but you should see my brother and you should see my father. Mm-hmm. You know, and my grandfather, Hugh Tracy, he came from a great man, Eugene Tracy, who was a doctor in Southwest of England. So I am on the tail end of all these people standing on the shoulder of these guys. And I recognize it. And, you know, having a strong um, male influence in your life, a father, man, that is priceless. I can't even imagine <laughs> what, what it would be like without that. Yeah, I see it today too. Oh yeah. I see the results, you know, and we've studied this. This is not shocking, but it's apparently easier said than done because 90% of the time when you're talking about someone that you're being outraged on the news, go look at who this guy's dad was, if he had one. And you know, it just doesn't exist. And vice versa, by the way, you look at guys, have you seen the documentary, um, the Last Dance, Michael Jordan, no, no. A, a, a incredible documentary um, on Netflix. And you know, a huge chunk of it is about Michael Jordan and his relationship with his father and what an incredible influence that man was. I mean, he totally engineered Michael Jordan's success as a man. Wow. And uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think it's invaluable and um, should be, people shouldn't shy away from acknowledging that this is an essential component for the next generation. You think the pendulum ever swings back? I hear you referencing mainstream media and the false narratives. That, and you know, mm. if if you believe in a, do you believe in a higher power at all? On, in, in like, do you believe that the Big Bang just came together statistically by chance, or do you think that, that there's something other than us that's kind of, you know, I, I'm, <laughs> I'm willing, I'm willing to go to mm. the alien ant farm before I am there's no other higher hmm. power you know what I mean and, and are you somewhere in the deist camp is that what I'm no, no I'm, a, I'm a Christian I grew up Catholic and was never hmm. you know a cafeteria Catholic not faithful at all now I've got a great church like rock and roll pretty church so it's huh. sort of, uh, Pentecostal I think and I'm really involved I'm video director so and, and I mentor a bunch of the kids that are on camera and then I, I look after the real young ones, the preschoolers downstairs once a month. So it means something to me. So I find myself talking about church more because mm. I'm involved in it. Uh still struggle with, you know, all of it. Um, but mm. you know, I, I've got a stronger faith now than I ever have. But when I stand on the side of the ocean or the lake here in St. Catharines and I look out 
at a sunset. I'm like, dude, there's no way that this place was created with, you know, I think well, it's a, my personal belief that mm -hmm. the statistical chances of this just happening to have a perfect place to live right here, uh, just from chance without something further going, Oh, so you need, uh, Oh, you need biosphere. Okay. Well, here we go. And like I well, said, I, I would lean towards the, uh, I heard Rogan put it great the other day. He was comparing, um, uh, dogs to mm -hmm. humans. He says like, here, you got a, a, a miniature poodle and a mastiff. Now they can have sex and have offspring weird. They look completely different, but that's the same breed. And we, we made them ourselves from wolves. Now you put a, you know, a Chinese girl beside, beside a Ugandan. Wow. They do, they ever look different, but they can still have sex, you know? And he, he's leaning towards the, I think, you know, uh, or maybe he wasn't saying he thinks, but for the notion that, you know, something uh, put us here and they're like, yeah, okay, let's just close this up in their own little atmosphere. And we'll come back in a couple of hundred thousand years and see. How <laughs> well, I mean, there's a lot to say there. Uh, for starters, I, I appreciate your appreciation of the majesty of the earth and the beauty of a sunset and Canada and whatnot. Uh, I, the church had a positive influence in my life uh, growing up. You know, I went to school at a religious kind of school. I mean, it was very mild religion, but I was part of the Boy Scouts. I'm an Eagle Scout. That's infused with religion. I also went to a Christian youth group primarily to try to hook up with a girl I had a crush on, but they were the Methodists, they were nice. And they're very pleasant people and whatnot. But I find it interesting, you say, do you believe in a higher power? And it's an odd question to field as an atheist because there's an implication that you're higher than what? And you're basically saying higher than us humans. And it's like, yeah, everything is more <laughs> powerful than us. Like we are this tiny, like we don't even have mastery over entropy or you know we're these mortal beings that are around for a sliver of time we're on a mm -hmm. spinning globe we don't we don't even know barely where we are mm -hmm. you know now we're, we're getting somewhat of a better sense of it but oh of course of course it's an unbelievable higher power we're, we're in the middle of it we're surrounded by it but whether it's intelligent or not that's the question mm -hmm. uh, when you say all these things have happened and everything's so perfect uh, it's the earth and reality is far from perfect. I mean, for starter, mm. the um, Andromeda galaxy is heading our way and it's going to collide into us and we're going to die. The sun's going to blow up. We got cancer. We got AIDS. We got Corona. We got bacteria everywhere. We got, I mean, it, it is a very uh, amusing take that we are living in some sort of a perfect realm. There's chaos everywhere. And we have undulated our way to where we are today over millennia of time. And so when you talk about, yeah, there's a person in Africa that looks like this and a person in China that looks like that, we have an explanation for that. I mean, we understand evolution just like we understand it with dogs on a shorter time scale. So our, I think increasing our understanding of this stuff is a smart move. I don't think it necessarily has to take away from the, the awe and the majesty of reality. I don't think it's like, oh, party's over. We figured out what a solar eclipse is. You know, it's just, it's still pretty awesome to behold. Mm -hmm. um, I would put to you a, something that is of interest to me, um, which is eternal life. And I'm talking about actual eternal life. There's a transhumanist movement. I'm not sure what all the things they're into, but I've talked to a few people, a, a part of it. And I think that one of the reasons we have not dedicated any time or resources into this is because most of the people on the planet think they're going to live forever already. <laughs> and and I, I really think if we could nudge you guys off of that position and say, I think you have overplayed your hand here a little bit. Uh, I agree that I like eternal life. I like the concept of it. But how about let's get it for real? Um, I mean, that could be that could be something good because humans, if we put our mind to something, we, we've been able to achieve some pretty impressive things, not us in particular, but collectively. Yeah, I um, I wonder what an intelligent man like yourself, um, why he wouldn't hedge his bets and go, oh, so all I got to do is believe, and when I get up there, I got eternal life. Yeah, okay, because I mean, I made, <laughs> that, I made that wager when I was a small uh, child. I'm like, oh, wait a second. Okay, so 
all I got to do is believe. And mm-hmm. if I don't believe and I get up there, I'm fucked. Okay, well, uh, um, okay. Okay, well, let me ask you this. How, well, this is the old pas- Pascal's wager, but are you, how hedging are, of your bets are you, are you doing here? Are you, yeah. are you praying to Allah? Are you doing any Hindu oh, stuff? I'm covering all the, no, no, no. I'm not hedging my bets that way, for sure. Okay, so you just got the one, the one God. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay. Uh, good point, man. <laughs> Well, yeah, it's a, it's an interesting concept, this whole discussion about God and, you know, a lot of it's tied to the afterlife. Um, the Muslims seem to be a little bit more hyper-focused on that, mm-hmm. but, you know, the Christians definitely, they have a lot to say about how to live this life and they place value on this life as well. Mm-hmm. But there is a lot of talk about this era of time that comes post-death which people like me have, you know, are incredibly certain does not exist. Mm-hmm. And that seems like a massive uh, gamble to, to invest and to think that this is something that's on its way when there's really no evidence to suggest that there is. Mm. And, you know, I, I definitely get the impulse or the need to, to squash the fear of oblivion. I get that. Mm-hmm. And I understand why it would be very appealing to believe this, but so who is it that said, like, I don't choose my beliefs. I believe what I believe. And I'm just going to report to you what I believe. It's, you know, if someone presented an argument, my beliefs might change. But this is not a choice. I couldn't believe in an afterlife if I wanted to. Mm-hmm. Because it, I just don't have a reason to do it. What have you shifted on over the last little while as far as your mm-hmm. beliefs go? Like, I mean, I've revisited uh, all kinds of things. Late term abortions, one of them. You know, mm-hmm. I, I really didn't, I never looked south of the border for my political addiction. Uh, I was always a, you know, like a 10 time candidate in Canada. So I was all about municipal, regional, provincial, and federal. You know, I'd watch the elections in the States, but now since Trump, I cannot take my eyes off it. And thank mm-hmm. God for Trump. I mean, I, I'm a reluctant supporter only because you made me defend him, not you, but the people, mm-hmm. you know, the Trump haters out there. You took everything out of context. You made it try, you lied to us basically in mainstream media, which is, yep. I don't know how the pendulum swings back from being this retarded for lack of a better term. <laughs> like it's just unbelievable. And they're still doing it. They're still lying to us on a 24 seven cycle. So <sighs> it's a, it's a perfect example to say, uh, you know, when he talked about their very fine people on both sides and mm-hmm. I've defended Trump too, and I hate the guy. Mm-hmm. Um, but you know, th- this is a lie every time they bring it up, they right. say, Oh, he's saying the Nazis are good people. He went out of his way. He said, I'm not talking about those people. I'm talking about people on the right who are at this rally who are not the problematic dudes. Mm-hmm. And clearly that is a group. And he, he said they were fine people. And so now, you know, people are lying brazenly and intentionally about this man. So they're straw manning him, but they're just lying. I mean, they're offering up something that is ethically outrageous. Now the question comes to a person like me, I hate Trump, but do I also hate liars? Okay, let's say I hate them both. Who, who do I hate worse? Mm-hmm. Where is my, what does my moral code say? My hatred of Trump trumps my hatred of liars. So I'm gonna side with the liars and be silent about that because I hate Trump? I mean, these are the questions. It's like, uh, you know, you're playing chicken. It's like morally playing chicken and you have to make these decisions in real time. And I I think a lot of people are making the wrong decisions. So I I think they should be shamed for it. Uh, I'm entering into a new phase where I'm running into a dilemma. How do you shame the shameless? (laughs) You know, that's really what it comes down to because if a person has an audience and if they're getting money, what's going to stop them? You're appealing to their inner, what, Jiminy Cricket? They don't care. It's obvious they don't care. So they'll be as hypocritical as you could ever hope. As far as things that I've changed about, I haven't given much thought to certain issues like, you know, the trans issue was a new one Mm -hmm. for me. Um, I sort of morphed on that. Over a larger period of time, I sort of morphed on gays. When I was a teenager, I was sort of like uh, a little uncomfortable or just like, I guess it was also foreign to me. I didn't quite understand it and then i realized oh who cares Mm -hmm. (laughs) it doesn't it's natural for them it's no threat to me you know mazel tov like go for it so yeah it didn't it didn't phase me at all but there was a little period of time where i was just ignorant and sort of i don't know just a little bit timid about 
addressing that. But nowadays, I would say um, what we talked about earlier with outrage. So realizing that you're not going to cure everyone of their stupidity. Um, you're, you know, you're not even an activist. So you have to be very clear about what your goals are every time you're expressing yourself online. Is, are you doing this for you? Are you trying to change someone's mind? Are there any way, metrics we can follow where you're going to call off the dogs if you hit a certain thing? Hmm. So I'm more involved in just valuing my time and knowing why I'm doing what I'm doing. What do you think that is? Like if you had a higher purpose or, you know, mm -hmm. like an actual underlying commitment on this planet, I, I think mm -hmm. we struggle as a human race to, to kind of, you know, the question of why are we here? Yeah. Type of thing. I don't know that it goes that deep, but you know, mm -hmm. what your purpose might be. I feel like, well, I wasn't designed to be in real estate. I was in that 27 years and, you know, I didn't enjoy all that much. And I remember saying, well, you know, what, what the hell am I doing here? Like, uh, you know, mm -hmm. I'm not making a difference for anyone. And one of my clients was sitting <laughs> beside me at a bar one time. She says, well, you made a difference for me, you know? And I was like, mm -hmm. yeah, well, that's great. And, you know, then, you know, I get the radio show. I'm talking to some interesting guests. You know, you couldn't have the type of conversation that we're having here. Well, it's just too frank, I think. But mm -hmm. I feel like for me anyways, it's speaking out against these false narratives because we're being lied to on the regular and it's mainstream media. And that's why I say, I don't know that the pendulum will ever come back, but what, what do you kind of figure? Is this what you're doing right now? Is this kind of what you think your purpose is? Well, it's an ever shifting answer. And I'm always questing to try to find a higher plateau of fulfillment and happiness. And it, trust me, it's on my mind often, all the time. Um, I don't think, I think a lot of um, the people I meet and any sort of positive influence I can have is kind of a happy accident. So I create content. I did it for me initially. I didn't get paid for it at all for years. Um, I did it for a laugh. I did it for expression. I come from an artistic family. I'm an art, artistic kind of a guy myself. So the very act of creation uh, is rewarding, I would say. But then I'd get emails and people would say, hey, you made me laugh. Me and my girlfriend watch your videos. Mm -hmm. Or, hey, that video you did about suicide helped me out. Like, yeah. I, I, I lost 100 pounds. I'm getting my life together. Thank you. So those things make me think, damn, maybe I should mm -hmm. try to help people as much as possible. Maybe that's the quest. Of course, there's practical c concerns. You know, I got to um, entertain people. I got to pay the bills. But that's not the ultimate. It's not let's just try to get money. Let's just try to rinse and repeat. And, you know, I, there's other considerations. Um, you know, the, the one thing that often dawns on me is the answer to these questions as far as what's the point, what are we doing here? A lot of it can be sidetracked or answered immediately when you have kids. Mm. So the kids thing, and I, I don't have kids. And so I know that if I did have kids, any question like that, it'd be like, well, I'm here for my kids. Mm -hmm. I'm here to spend time with my kids. I'm here to give my kids the best life, you know? So the, the real, and that's great. I, I totally understand that. But if you don't have kids, the question becomes a little trickier. Mm -hmm. And it's like, what the hell are you doing? And why are you just surviving? I mean, that that's a, seems like a very empty and mm -hmm. scary sort of Darwinistic landscape of I'm just- You're subsisting financially. Mm -hmm. Right. So paycheck to paycheck and I'm just, I'm living to live and I'm a consumer of TV shows and I'm just, you know, I'm being distracted left and right all day on my phone, on the computer. And next thing you know, a year has gone by, then five and you're just like, what, what's going on? Um, I would say people uh, are where you should invest. I find people in my personal life to be, you know, the, the most important thing, um, even strangers. You know, the fact that I can reach out to strangers and have an impact, that there's a huge power in that. And so, yeah, I, I don't know. I, the Christian ethic, honestly, like just try to be a good person and um, mm -hmm. li live in a, in a moral way and have a sense of humor and, and, you know, do the right thing, whatever, you know, whatever you think that is. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's a good starting point. As far as maximizing every piece of ecstasy and um, bliss, that's a trickier one. Mm. It's, it's always surprising to me how many people disavow the Christian ethic and the moral mm. foundation that it's set up. I remember, I, mean, I think it was Shapiro saying the other day that, you know, everything comes from 
we've created you in our image type of thing. Um, and that's, you know, a verse out of Genesis and going, wow, our whole moral compass <laughs> set up from this old book and our laws and everything. And, you know, I think Jordan Peterson said it to the fact that like, I don't consider myself Christian, but I live by the Christian principles. Yeah. So many of us do. And, you know, now, you know, I think for many of us that, that you know, there's so many people that consider themselves Christian that just don't practice that are saying, you know what, uh, this is, you, you can't kill God. And like Nietzsche said, figuratively, and, but he was lamenting the fact that you're taking one of the major pillars of foundation, a successful civilization out of the mix. And then you take fathers out of the home. And I, I man, I am resigned and cynical to see how we ever get this back. Yeah. I mean, I would say, I think I'm obligated to say as an atheist that uh, while I recognize that there are good parts to Christian doctrine and ideology, I, I don't think they have a monopoly on it. And I don't think they trademarked it. Like, I think they are taking credit for like the golden rule existed before Christianity and after, and there's a ton of non-Christians who abide by it. So I, I think that a lot of these things are intuitive in us naturally. Mm -hmm. um, obviously they need to be shaped and there's always fringe issues around the corners, uh, around the edges where it's like, what is the right way to think about this issue? So, for example, we live in a secular society. It's not Christian country, but obviously many of our laws, you know, were made by Christian men and um, they reflect that. But our laws are our laws and they exist on their own merit. So if I say to you, thou shall not kill, that you don't need to reference God or the Bible to understand that we all agree that that's a good law. Mm -hmm, yeah. And so I do think that there is a way, a graceful way to uncouple religiosity from our moral um, compass. Um, it exists already. And Christians would acknowledge that. They acknowledge that non-Christians are moral and good. Um, so I don't think it's that outrageous of an idea. But yes, there are pitfalls and it can go awry. And we've seen that as well. Cool, man. Are you uh, are you in a relationship? Is your are you planning on spitting out children? Is that one of your because you know I'm I'm 52, right? Mm -hmm. well, I mean I haven't completely missed the boat, but it would take you know it would take some some searching to find someone that mm -hmm. could help me with this, you know, and find someone that you know I could be uh, compatible with. Um, well, and I feel yeah. like you know I see it in women uh, a lot as well, and I, and lately i've been trying i've been thinking oh geez like am i succumbing to that that childless uh, hmm. lack of purpose in my life because i see mm -hmm. it in professional women that are all like oh well i missed my boat there and now they're just fucking angry cat ladies forever i'm not that guy i love the kids so i'm like borderline obsessed with them i just like i'm fascinated by their innocence their their facial mm. expressions their st the way they talk like it, there's just no end to it so is that something that you've got in you're working towards as far as the plan goes? Well, f first of all, I think if you're looking for a lady, you, maybe you could repair the relationship with that female Canadian politician and see if she's available. Uh, but yeah, I, I, it is in negotiation, but um, I am with a girl. She is not keen on the idea. And so this has put me into a bit of a, you know, a quandary. Um, I was, I was of the mindset that I would be with her and that she was going to be the one to convince me to have kids. And I was going to be the reluctant one going, ah, do we really? And that, that evolution has not happened at all. And I think about these things and I weigh the pros and the cons. And yeah, it's interesting. The, without kids, what is the point? What are you doing? What is the grand purpose? Because the answer when you have kids is so dis definitive. It's so mm -hmm. in your face. And, you know, it can, we've referred to it as a bit of a cop out, you know, in some ways you could look at it that way because, you know, it's almost like your personhood is gone and now you're just this yeah. parental unit who's mm -hmm. totally centered. But I think it speaks to also our sense of purpose and belonging. So even if you don't belong to a, a company or a team or a tribe, you belong to another human. They belong to you, literally, like the state, like they are yours and you are theirs. And this is a, 
a bond and a, a relationship that is very powerful and very primal. And so I could see that being a very significant thing to not dismiss out of hand. Um, you know, I'm speaking from a place of somewhat ignorance because I, I, haven't, I haven't done this, but I see it with others and I recognize the sacrifice, the time, the, I mean, it's basically a life crushing maneuver, uh, <laughs> but um, it might be worth it. That's, that's the interesting part. Yeah. Dude, I want to keep your, uh, keep you on time here. I know you're a busy guy and tell me a little bit about your video production. Is this all you and where'd you come up with the Rue? Where, where'd you get to? Like, I love this, this character. <laughs> at exactly the right time. I did a video, uh, a live pop-up a Sunday morning. Um, mm -hmm. I, I didn't go, you know, I didn't put my camera up or anything, but I covered you. I covered JB Beverly, which comes up tomorrow at, at uh, noon. I think he's a cool guy too. Just he's got a lot of punk rock in him experience. And as I was doing the video, as I watched, I watched a little bit of a uh, playback, make sure the sound and everything was right. As I was commenting on your silent, which I've got running right in the background now, uh, just the cool. silent sensor.tv footage, your kangaroo was blinking when I was making points. How do you do that, bro? <laughs> <laughs> the blink comes from, yeah, I, I was going to be a traditional animator. I, I used to oh, work really? for Disney and Pixar and yeah, I, I went to UCLA and I studied animation. And so the blink is a remnant of my old 2D animating skills. But right. the origin of it was I um, originally I, I needed an avatar and I picked Christopher Hitchens because I was totally geeking out about being a, a new atheist. <laughs> and I loved Hitchens, still love Hitchens. Yeah. Um, and after I started making a few videos, I got a little bit of an audience. I thought, why am I pretending like I'm Hitchens? Like it's kind of a poser move. Like I'm not Hitchens. So right. I should probably come up with something else. And I did a video on the creation debate, which was Bill Nye versus Ken Ham. And they had this big debate and it was kind of a big internet deal. And one of the points that was made that Bill Nye made was why do we not see any kangaroo skeletons anywhere in between Israel and Australia? Like, don't you think, I mean, if they, got there on Noah's Ark how the hell did they get all the way over there without dying like I mean and so it was in that video that I chose this image which was an image taken from a very religious woman on her way to church actually in Australia and it was based off a real picture of a kangaroo just staring at the camera and from there fans of mine drew different versions of it and it just sort of morphed into what it is today Oh, it's beautiful, man. I love it. And I, I really like the way you put, ooh, you've introduced me to more music. I, I don't know that it's <laughs> great, but it's, it's somehow addictive, man, that some of the stuff, like I find myself mm -hmm. shazamming the, the beginning of your Awesome. To find I love it. These, uh, these artists are, and you know, I don't know what type of music genres you're jumping mm -hmm. on these days, but man, some of the opening videos are just, I can't get enough of the music that you're uh, I really appreciate that. That's a little byproduct, a little side thing, which I love because, you know, I'm, I'm a Nirvana guy and I, I enjoy my old school stuff, but I try to keep abreast of new stuff and discovering quality new stuff is rather difficult and time consuming. I like the but, yoga footage. Like, oh yeah. yeah. These girls. I know. I know. There's it's human form. It's very Jones beautiful. <laughs> So oh yeah. I'm the one the yoga girl. I'm like, what the hell? I can't I can't stop. Who is this? I, <laughs> I know she's adorable. She's like this fitness model out in England and she's I mean, very talented contortionist. But I am a fan of beauty and aesthetic things and uh, I'm I have no shame in it. And as far as music, I you have to grip and rip because a lot of people are gonna hate, you know, if you put up songs and go, Hey, I like the song, people are gonna say, Oh, I hate that song, you're an idiot. Your taste in music sucks. I'm like, all right, whatever. So I'm just um, choosing to ignore and powering forward. And I think that's the, the way you kind of got to be. If you create content online, you got to trust in yourself and just go for it. Cool, man. How's, uh, how's things been on censored.tv? How are you finding things as far as the um, platform goes? It's uh, working out for you as far as propagation? Yeah, I, I have my wishes. I, I wish they had a, a live premiere type feature. I wish I could interact more with my audience. Um, and it's, you know, you have to swallow your pride a little bit when the numbers are, are weighed down compared to YouTube, but these are paying customers and I feel, you know, it's an honor that they would feel the, the need to help me out like that. And, and so I want to provide them with entertainment and just be a small part in their life. And so 
I stay motivated and I'd like to grow and I'm trying my best and I'm entering into new topics. Uh, this week is going to be basically pedophile week. Uh, I'm doing a, a couple videos on pedophilia um, from a few different angles. And yeah, I'm just going to explore what's going on with pedophilia today. Bro, uh, just on the way out, how do you stay motivated? Because this is something, you know, you get beat down, you read too much of the news about you, you feel like you're a piece of garbage and, you know, you start to believe the lies maybe a little bit. I don't know. I think we're all human that way. But sometimes, and the more I sit in this office chair, the more I'm convinced it's trying to kill me. Like, how, <laughs> how do you stay, you know, how do you keep, you know, your, your, your mental state, your positive mental mm. attitude enough to sit down and create content? every day yeah i would say you have to take breaks you have to have a mind body and spirit have to be fully operational so i would say physical activity um breaks where you can refresh your your whole system and come back uh you have to it's more than thick skin you have to you have to also have humility and understand that you're not that big of a deal mm. you know like there's a billions of people on the planet. I mean, life goes on, like nature's doing its thing. You are just one small little voice in here. So forget all the negative influences. Just you got to stay positive and you have to contribute and you have to put your best foot forward and create something that has value. And yeah, you have to, it has to come from within and you, you have to really be guarded, not just by the insults, um, but by the compliments. You can't let the compliments get to you. They do. It's nice. You'll get an email from time to time, but mm. it, it can't. It's always nice. You know what I mean? I remember you saying that on the mm. with your father going, dude, like, like seriously. And you really trying to help this complete stranger because he mm. reached out and said, Hey, I'm, I'm really struggling here. Yeah. That's uh, that's always alarming. And if you scratch the surface and say, Hey, is anyone feeling depressed or whatever? I mean, it's taboo and it doesn't, have many social benefits to announce that publicly, but a lot of people are experiencing a lot of grief internally. People are living lives of quiet misery, and especially during Corona, the isolation, you got winter. I mean, I'm feeling it right now. There's no sun to be sp spoken of outside. And I think, you know, all we have is each other. That's the way it's always been. And that's a humanistic point of view. I know the Christians would say that there's another realm and there's other angels and forces and gods, but I I think we have to look to each other to to help each other out uh, when and where possible. I think you said a couple of important things there, and it reminds me of my men's group. I've got a men's group that I go to on mm -hmm. well, Zoom now, but it used to be local. Where we get together, and it's based out of my church, but it's basically just men, right? You know, mm -hmm. it's, like I said, it's Christian men, but it's not always about. It's more about like supporting each other, right? And you know, so much of the time I come in there and I'm you know with my struggles, and I go, guys, this. And, you know, it only takes one of the guys to go, Jimmy, you're, you're not that special. You're just like us. Like, stop it. And I think we forget uh, that. And, you know, my pastor's doing a, a series on, on loving your neighbor as, you, you know, lo loving your enemy type of thing too, right? Mm -hmm. And you forget, like, you know, if you come from this belief, we're all, even if you're not a Christian, we're all exactly the same. We're all broken in the same way. We've mm -hmm. got our good, we've got our bad, but, you know. Uh, you know, as much as we carve on the people that aren't like us or are socially outcast because of their actions, you know, talk about pedophilia and stuff like that. Like, I can't think of anything more outrageous. But now <laughs> it seems like the left is kind of making perversion normal. Like, you got drag, drag queen story time. Like, this is normal for grade three. Are you freaking kidding me? So it's hard to love your neighbor when he's banging children. Like, fuck. Yeah, I like I, that's a good point. Uh, I like that you have a men's Christian group. It reminds me of the YMCA. Isn't that a young men's Christian association? Yeah. Uh, well, yeah, the drag stuff is is a real trip too because those drag queens, I mean, I, I watched this uh, RuPaul show, Drag Race, and it's, it's a hell of a show. It's a great, it's like wins all these awards. It's a very fun show. There are quite a lot of characters on there. And, you know, I feel bad for them because they tend to come from traumatic backgrounds mm -hmm. and they have issues, you know, God bless them. They're, some of them are very talented and fashionable and, you know, I wish them well, but then I, I support that show and what those people are trying to do. But then who signed up for this story time thing? Mm -hmm. When was that decided? What the hell is that about? Yeah. I mean, it just seems very random. 
And obviously we have to figure out where to draw the line with all this stuff because lines do need to be drawn. And the problem is people don't, I don't think people like line drawers. I think they have a, a knee jerk reaction to who is this person to tell me I can't do this or that. But even still, we, we need to have constraints on these things. Yeah. Well, it seems like, uh, like Jordan Peterson got me with the, the, the big five, because I had no idea about the big five, but you're actually born a liberal. You're born an artist. You're born mm -hmm. creative. You're born left leaning. And you know, you, you talk about the people that are drawing the lines. Those are the conservatives. They're, they have no creative bones in their body. They don't invent businesses. That's all the left. But these are the guys <laughs> that run the businesses when the left drive them into the ground because you know, they just don't have what, and I just, I, you know, I was looking for the answer to why are we so far apart? Why is the divide so deep and wide, both for men and women and left and right politically. And then I think I came after years of, you know, like digging into it with university lectures and anything I could read or listen to, I came up with the, well, wait a second, we're not all that, We've been further apart before, and I think every generation's had their time when they went, oh, geez, can you believe this? Like, we're talking about creation there. You know, there was actually a time on this planet when guys like us looked up at the moon and the sun and went, what the hell is that thing, man? Like, we, yeah. can you imagine yeah. the first guy that rolled up and said, hey, dude, have you seen fire? It's fucking awesome. You can cook food. It's like, uh -huh. there's actually a time on this planet when those things were all foreign to us, but... And we have a better understanding of them now, but you know, we still don't understand a black hole unless you're Don Lemon, you know, or you know, there's <laughs> other mysteries that have evaded us. But uh, yeah, well, I, don't, I don't know why people are left and right, but I would like to study it because I, I try to understand the patterns. And I, I do think that there are some certain disgraceful things going on on the left, which my, my concern is primarily the left because I would like to have it be cleaned up and be the best it could be and it clearly has just cancerous elements in it with and terrible ideas and so i try to figure it out but th there are certain things that make it hard to ascertain one is region if you're from a region that is primarily one thing it makes sense for you to fit in socially if your family is of a political persuasion if you go against them you're now the black sheep and you're going to be ostracized from your family so that would compel you to not do that so if we could remove those variables and get to the core of why does a person lean one way or the, uh, the other and you mentioned age is one of these things and and also just appearance people just like the idea of i want to appear to be a good person a good citizen mm -hmm. i want to be attractive to the people in my social group Twitter comment, Devin must father. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Got well, I, I'm on Twitch and D live too, which never happens. So maybe it's the title. Good guess. Uh, Thanks, awesome. Well, I mean, I'm, I'm enjoying being an uncle and I enjoy, you know, I've sort of backdoored my way into being um, a older um, male figure in people's lives, which um, How old are you? I'll, I'll take it. Uh, I'm 45. Oh, okay. Yeah. And uh, I was never planning on being 45. I can tell you that. <laughs> really? Not, not, not that I was planning to like die young or something, but um, yeah, it's, it's an, I, I feel like 25. Yeah. I hear you there, man. Yeah. It never changes. I don't know what. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, well, I, I, yeah, I, I talked to my dad about it and he's uh, considerably older and he, um, he feels like, you know, 27. <laughs> like, I mean, <laughs> I don't know. It's weird. Teenagers going, oh, dude, why am I looking at her? Well, because you've look, been looking at her your whole life, you weirdo. <laughs> right. I mean, but see that now that we're getting into the pedophilia talk, which is, I think those guys have some sort of weird, yeah. well, obviously it's weird, but they must have imprinted upon sexual attraction. Like the first time they were sexually attracted, for some reason, mm. it will always be that age well, of a girl. It runs deeper, obviously, with uh, environment, you know, the nurture nature thing. And I don't understand. Uh -huh. all. I don't care to or, or but I mean, when you see. Wait. Yeah, go ahead. But why, why would you not care to? Because should we not try to understand it so we oh, can yeah, um, deal with it? Yeah, I think I'm afraid to, to be honest, I'm afraid to look deeper into it 
because mm-hmm. why the fuck should I care? You know, I, I got other things to uh, like, <laughs> well, because... need to stand for like freedom of speech and all that kind of stuff. But yeah, you're right. And wow. this is my frustration with the radical left. Mm-hmm. How do you, how do you help if you can't understand? And right. you know, this idea that there's people coming out defending, like these people don't have a choice. They're attracted to children and they can't do anything about it. It's like being gay. I'm like, Oh, <gasps> Wait a second, dude. You can't talk like that. Are you fucking kidding me? That almost makes it like you're saying it's acceptable. Mm-hmm. No, that those arguments are dangerous. Mm-hmm. But um, I would say it's important to understand. So you could say someone's wrong all day and night. It's not going to really penetrate or get through to them. If you can understand what their the the reason why they came to their conclusion. So if someone is expressing viewpoints that are um, laced with white guilt. You must understand where white guilt comes from and really dissect that. So therefore, you're not going to be surprised by anything they say. That I go down the road that says, dude, we've been doing this for millennia. It's just how we're wired. Like, uh, yeah. It's just socially unacceptable. I'm like, dude, I don't get it because that's like, ugh. I can't think it. Like, I'm very strongly heterosexual. You know, mm. I can't help the fact that, you know, I can, I can kiss a buddy. I could even French kiss a buddy of mine in the mouth, but you know, the thought of like, like having sex with another man, just, just, I'm not saying like, it just fucking repulses me. Right. (laughs) Yeah. I know. I totally get it. (laughs) Um, Mm -hmm. Because that's how we're wired. But uh, yeah, I think I'm afraid to get down the road and go, um, yeah, we've been doing this since the beginning of time. You fucking idiot. Now it's unacceptable. You know, I'm afraid for Hmm. that too i I appreciate the question though because i've never really yeah i say something and i don't have enough people in my life to go wait a second you just said this but why yeah i'm like oh fuck great point man so thanks for that well also yeah i mean as a as a active christian i mean pedophilia it must be a topic that will come up at some point Mm. um you know you have to address and acknowledge the skeletons in that closet not personally but as you know, the church overall, I mean, that's highly troubling. Yeah. Institutionally. Yeah. I mean, Oh Just boy. For the, the power lays, I think it's bound to be corrupted and yeah. Why the, why the sick minds and what we consider sick minds are attracted that way is a whole other debate, but I appreciate your time, man. Thank you mm. very much. Uh, just on the way out, uh, contact information, where can people find you and give you some love brother. Okay. Well, Atheism is unstoppable.com is my website. You can pretty much find everything there. Uh, if you want to see my new videos, they're over at censored.tv. And if you use the coupon code AIU, it does a few things. One, it gives me half of the money. Yeah. If not, G- Gavin gets all of the money and it gives you 20% off. And so you can get a monthly, yearly, it's, uh, it's all good. So they and put you it, at a sales position at censored.tv. <laughs> that's okay. Yeah, yeah. If you don't bring in the subs, you don't get paid. You you bring them in, we split it with you. That's a great. That's a. I don't know if you're speaking out of school, but that's a that's a great setup. It's a great way yeah. to get on board. I appreciate the talk. It was a. Uh, I, I I really much enjoyed it, and um, it was a real pleasure and an honor to to visit you. Thank you, brother. So, um, yeah, just let me acknowledge you as well for being accessible. You know, uh, mm-hmm. you're a big deal. Uh, you didn't have to do this. And, uh, I appreciate talking to people with solid takes and convictions, no matter what they are. And even better if they disagree with me, because then they, they challenge you and they're like, wait a second. Well, why? I'm like, oh shit. No one's asked me that before. <laughs> That's what happened. Yeah. You got to get the wheels turning and variety is the spice of life and you cannot echo chamber it to the end of time. Awesome, brother. I love you. Uh, Thank you for the time. And we will chat again soon, maybe. All right. Awesome. Signing out. Peace out, everyone. Peace, love, and go hug your neighbor. Take that mask off. Where's my Zoom call here? All right. We should be out. You still there? Yeah, I'm here. Thanks, brother. That was fun. Yep. Awesome. I appreciate your time and your thoughts on things and shit. You're exact. You know, when you show up to a blind date or you maybe uh-huh. you're like, Oh shit, you're nothing like your picture. Uh, exactly how I imagined you, man. You sound that's exactly, great. You know, very predictable. And maybe that's a bad thing to say, but no, I appreciate <laughs> time, man. Uh, great talk. And uh, I love yeah, hey, you, man. It's a, it's a beautiful thing. Well, that's, it, it's sweet to hear, hear you say that. Um, let me know when you put, post this or how I could access it and I will send it out to my fans. 
It's up at the top of my Twitter feed. It's up at the top of my Facebook feed. It's okay. Twitter, Twitch, D Live. It was live on all of them. It might make it. It might take a little time to render. Got it. But it'll be there uh, within minutes, and then I'll put something else. I've got about four YouTube channels. I'll send you a link of it when it goes up there. Incredible. Well, that was that was super fun, and I wish you the best. Maybe uh, I'll thanks, stop man. by and visit you next, next time I'm up in uh, Toronto area. Dude, for sure. I'm a, I'm an hour away. I'll hook you up. Excellent. Okay. Take it easy.